Now, I will share with you the early examples of this stoichiometry-based, steady-state-based metabolic flux calculations. Just to give you an idea of those research papers. So the first paper appeared, almost the first paper, as far as I know, uh, in 1976 in Journal Biotechnology and Bioengineering. This work was cited 46 times so far based on Google Scholar. And this is the title of the paper, Mass and Energy Balance Analysis of Metabolic Pathways Applied to Citric Acid Production by Aspergillus Niger. And in 1979, a similar paper appeared, again in biotechnology and bioengineering. That paper was cited more than 100 times so far. And the name is Identification of Metabolic Model Straight Production from Glucose by Candida Lipolitica. So both paper focused on citric acid production, but by different microorganisms. The first paper you will see now, I will share some screenshots with you, is basically using TCA cycle and writing some balances based on TCA cycle and making some predictions. The second paper is more advanced because it uses a lot of measured rates to make the system determined and then predicts some rates again by using TCA cycle reactions. So they have experimental data here for the verification of the predicted rates based on simple metabolic flux analysis. And these early models are so simple. Usually in the reactions, they don't have any ATP, NADH, NADPH defined, so they don't write any balance around ATP, NADH or NADPH and they don't write any balance on biomass. So they just focus on a single pathway, in this case, TCA cycle, and they write, they define their system boundary based on this uh, pathway, this specific pathway, and write their balances. So before sharing some screenshots from those two papers, which are the earliest examples of metabolic flux analysis, as far as I know. I want to talk about carbon mole concept. You don't need to know this now. Nobody uses it. But if you go to the papers from 70s, 80s, or 90s, you will see this very frequently. So that's why I want to share uh, the I want to define it. I want to share the details of it. So when you go and check a paper from 90s, for example, you wouldn't feel surprised. So normally we use the rate unit as mole per gram dry weight per hour. But in these early papers, the scientists usually prefer to use their unit as carbon mole per gram dry weight per hour rather than mole per gram dry weight per hour. What does it mean? What is carbon mole? And why do they do this? They did this to easily track how the input carbon is distributed over the pathway. I will give a very simple example and you will understand what I mean by this statement or how carbon mole is more useful than mole concept. So, our major substrate in metabolism is glucose, right? This is the chemical formula for glucose, C6H12O6. And if you calculate the molecular weight of one mole of glucose, 
you will see that it is 180 grams. Here we have six carbon. Right? So one mole of glucose is 180 gram. But if we write it in terms of one carbon in the glucose, this is what we define as carbon mole. So there are six carbons in glucose. If I divide it by six, my chemical formula will be CH2O and the corresponding molecular weight will be 30 grams. So one mole of glucose is 180 grams, but one carbon mole of glucose is 30 grams. Or we can say that one mole of glucose is equal to six carbon mole of glucose. Right? Because one carbon mole glucose is 30 gram. So six carbon mole of glucose will be 180 grams. So one mole of glucose is equal to six carbon mole of glucose. How is this useful? Why do we do it? Why did they do it, actually? Nobody does this uh, nowadays, as I said. Let's go through this simple example. Let's say you are told that 1.5 moles of pyruvate was produced from one mole of glucose. Normally, remember our glycolysis, from one glucose, you can produce a, a maximum of two pyruvate molecules, right? Glucose has six carbon, pyruvate has three carbons. So if all glucose goes to pyruvate, you will obtain two pyruvate molecules from one glucose. But that's not usually the case. Remember, glucose is converted to glucose 6 phosphate, and this glucose 6 phosphate can be diverted to pentose phosphate pathway. So, not all the glucose will go to the pyruvate, some of the glucose will go to pentose phosphate pathway. Also, for example, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, a metabolite in glycolysis, is also a precursor metabolite. So a small amount of it will be used for the synthesis of building blocks. So in reality, you will never see that the obtained pyruvate is twice the mole of input glucose. So in this specific example, so they have measured that from one mole of glucose, they have obtained 1.1 moles of pyruvate. And you are asked, which percentage of input, input glucose went to pyruvate? By looking at those numbers, 1 and 1.5, you cannot make an easy guess. You cannot say that 150% went there. That's not possible, right? There is this mass balance concept. So, uh, the output cannot be more than the input. But if you represent the amount of pyruvate and glucose in terms of carbon mole, you will easily see which percentage of glucose went to pyruvate. How? Let's go through it. So, one mole of glucose is our input, right? What is the carbon mole equivalent of this? Six carbon mole of glucose. Because glucose includes six carbons. So if you write glucose in terms of a single carbon, then one mole of glucose will be equal to six of 
those single carbon glucose molecules. What about pyruvate? Pyruvate includes three carbon molecules. So one mole of pyruvate will be equal to three carbon mole of pyruvate. What was our output? 1.5 moles of pyruvate. So 1.5 moles of pyruvate will be equal to 4.5 carbon moles of pyruvate. So this means that I had six carbon moles of glucose as input and 4.5 carbon moles of pyruvate was formed from this. So here I define glucose in terms of a single carbon. Here I define pyruvate in terms of a single carbon. So I can easily see how the input carbon is distributed over pathways because I always define all the metabolites in my system in terms of a single carbon. Then how many, uh, or which percentage of the single carbon goes to which metabolite I can easily track. So in this case, if I take simply the ratio of pyruvate to glucose in terms of their carbon moles, so 4.5 divided by 6, it is 75%. So 75% of the input glucose went to pyruvate. By using mole concept, you cannot easily say that, right? By, use, by checking these numbers here, you obtain 1.5 moles of pyruvate from 1 moles of glucose. So which percentage of pyruvate went to glucose, which percentage of glucose went to pyruvate? That's not easy to answer. But by using carbon mole concept, you can easily calculate pyruvate yield from glucose. So because of this practicality, in 70s, 80s, 90s, many researchers, when they applied metabolic flux analysis or flux balance analysis, they used carbon mole concept. So, normally this is the reaction from glucose to glucose 6 phosphate. Glucose has 6 carbon, glucose 6 phosphate also has 6 carbon. When you go to these early works of metabolic network analysis, you will see such equations. So, one glucose has 6 carbon. Rather than writing one glucose, they write, for example, six glucose because they define glucose in terms of carbon moles. So we have one carbon mole of glucose, but the input is 180 grams. So we need to write six C. So this C means this glucose is in terms of carbon moles. Uh, so it defines 30 grams of glucose, not 180 grams of glucose. And the same, this one has six carbon, so you will see this coefficient here. Or let's focus on another reaction from glycolysis. Here, fructose diphosphate has six carbon. Glyceryl dietary phosphate has three carbon. The hydroxyacetone phosphate has three carbon. So you can write the same equation in terms of carbon moles like this. So don't get surprised when you see those coefficients in the reactions in the early, early papers of uh, metabolic flux analysis. Now, after this introduction to carbon mole concept, I will shortly talk about early examples of metabolic flux analysis. As I said, this is the earliest example that I know. 
It's about citric acid production by Aspergillus niger, published in Biotechnology and Bioengineering. Uh, these are the earliest pa the, the, the papers published uh, almost 50 years ago, uh, 40 years ago. So, as you see, even the structure of the paper is different. They don't have an abstract, right? Directly, they start with an introduction. It's interesting. And let's read some sentences from the introduction part. So it says that it is useful to know the metabolic pathways by which organisms convert substrates to a given product. And it says that often there are many roads to a product. Right? That's what the metabolic network is. A single product can be produced by many different alternatives, alternative paths, because there are so many reactions involved in metabolic networks. So, to identify those many roads, they say that mass balance or energy balance techniques can be used. Let's see. Their focus was citric acid production by Aspergillus niger. And this is figure one from the paper. Their sketch of uh, TCA cycle indeed. So they start their pathway from pyruvate. Remember pyruvate was the end product of glycolysis and it goes to, it's, it is the starting uh, metabol, it is the, or it can be considered as the first metabolite for TCA cycle. So they have a TCA cycle defined, and each reaction was defined by a letter. I mean, currently we usually use V1, V2, V3, etc. But in this paper, they have used different letters to designate the rate of reactions. This is A, for example, this is B, etc. And they say that for this system, if you consider a system boundary, X is coming inside, so pyruvate uptake is one of the exchange reactions. And also this system produces straight citric acid, you know, this, that's the focus of the paper, citric acid production. So those organisms, those microorganisms are known to produce citric acid to secrete the citric acid they produce to outside the environment. And here, X is the rate of pyruvate uptake. And then citrate is secreted outside with a rate of Y. And in the paper, they say that there is also another product called oxalic acid, oxalate, that also can be produced by the organism with a rate of Z. So they have three exchange reactions, and all the reactions, other reactions are intracellular. Sorry, there is four actually. There is also carbon dioxide, as you see. Carbon dioxide is a gas, so it needs to be secreted out, right? There is also carbon dioxide, and in the paper it is defined as W, the rate of carbon dioxide product. So you will see this equation in the paper. First, it can look a bit weird, but here what they do is they use the metabolite ins and metabolite outs to write a generic mass balance in terms of carbon moles. So pyruvate is input. In terms of carbon mole, we can write 3x. X is the rate of pyruvate formation here and y represents citrate 
here. Citrate has six carbon, so you write six y here. Oxalate has two carbons, so oxaloacetate has four carbons. It is divided into two products. Acetate has two carbons. Oxalate has two carbons, and Z is the oxalate production rate. So it has two carbon. We see two Z here, and carbon dioxide. It has a single carbon, so you see this here. So with similar approach, they write mass balance equations. And they don't use any measured rate or so to solve for a specific case to predict rates. Rather, they try different scenarios. So this is the scenario where Z is zero, W is zero, and Y is one. So there is no oxalate production, no carbon dioxide production, only citric acid production. So what would be the mass balances in this scenario? Or what would be the mass balances if we have oxalic acid production and no carbon dioxide or citric acid production? And what would be the scenario if we only have carbon dioxide production? So for each of those cases, in this metabolic network, they try to predict active roads. So if there is only citrate production active, what is the road in this network to produce citrate, for example? Similarly for oxalic acid and carbon dioxide production. You will see the corresponding uh, roads they have predicted in their paper. And this is the references list. Again, I wanted to show it to you, you know, nowadays, uh, we never write research papers with only nine references. So at the time, the scientific literature was uh, already scarce, so it, was, it wasn't like there were many, many papers regarding the topics discussed. So you will see only nine reactions, ten reactions as references in those early papers. The second paper was published in 1979 against citric acid production. Now the paper has an abstract. Right? There is an uh, improvement in the style format of the paper. And let's read. It's talk about concept of the mass balance. And it says that this concept was used in this paper to analyze the metabolic pathways of straight production by candida lipolytica from glucose. And they have performed actually chemostat culture experiments and they measured many things. So this is quite different from the previous paper in terms of, uh, you know, measurement of some rates, etc. So they measured glucose consumption rate, straight production rate, how is the straight production rate, carbon dioxide secretion rate, and also uh, synthesis of some macromolecules, protein synthesis and carbohydrate synthesis. So this is kind of relevant to biomass reaction, growth rate. And they say that they solved simultaneously carbon balance equations by assuming steady state for intermediary metabolite pools. This is what we say, right? For the metabolites within the system boundary, within the cell membrane, so intracellular metabolites or intermediary metabolites, we assume that they are steady state and we solve the balance equations. So they say that they consider three models, so three different reaction systems. They are mostly the same, but in each reaction system, there are differences. 
and then by using three different reaction system they have covered they have predicted the rates so in their table one they give measurements measured rates for three different dilution no four different rate experiments you see carbon dioxide secretion rate for example here oxygen uptake rate you see citrate production isocitrate production rates etc and this is the their sketch from their paper this is how they have visualized their system there is glucose glucose goes to glucose 6 phosphate the whole glycolysis was represented as a single reaction right glucose goes to pyruvate and then pyruvate goes to oxaloacetate and acetyl coenzyme A and then uh, TCA cycle starts and glucose is one of the exchange metabolite taken from outside ammonium was also taken up from outside and carbon dioxide straight and isostrate are produced there is also carbohydrate production and protein production. Some of the carbons are used for the synthesis of carbohydrates, for the synthesis of proteins. Here the same pathway, later sketched again in the book of Bioreaction Engineering Principles by Vladis and Nis and Leiden, in a more understandable format. So their goal is to use such a simple system with around 15 reactions and to predict reaction rates. Here, their results. So they have predicted V3, V4, V6 for scenario 1, V4, V6, V7 for scenario 2, etc., etc. I won't go into detail, but this is, as far as I know, the first example where they have used state, state approach, they have used some measured rates, they used this determined system approach, metabolic flux approach, to predict some rates and uh, validate try they try to validate their assumptions i will also share the details of two examples this time from 90s just to show you that from 70s to 90s how the approach has improved and these papers are highly cited papers key papers actually when it comes to metabolic flux analysis and both papers use determined system solutions. In the first paper, they also use flux balance analysis, the optimization-based version. But as I said, they also have metabolic flux analysis application. So the first one is from Netherlands, from Heinen's group. And the focus is Saccharomyces cerevisia and candida utilis, two different microorganisms. So they say that metabolic networks have been constructed to describe the biochemistry of growth of those organisms. So they have defined slightly different uh, many metabolic networks. So what they do is they use a system of about 70 reactions. So this is much more than these earliest examples. Uh, and the reaction system not only covers central carbon metabolism, but also covers amino acid synthesis pathways, some of the biosynthesis reactions. And also, uh, as far as I remember, they are Reaction system also includes a biomass reaction. Here you see two figures from their paper. 
In this one, they simulate glucose uptake by Saccharomyces cerevisia, and for one unit of glucose uptake, how the fluxes are affected in aerobic environment, as far as I remember. And in the second one, they simulate simultaneous uptake of glucose and ethanol. So the organism consumes 91% of glucose, ethanol, and in this case, what will be the predicted rates? As you see, you will have a higher rate in TCA cycle reactions in this case. I won't go into details of the paper. It's a really long paper. And this is a screenshot from the reaction list. They didn't use the carbon mole concept when writing the reactions, but they used the carbon mole concept when they wrote the reaction rates here. So you, here you can easily see that for one carbon mole of glucose, 30% of the coming glucose is going to TCA cycle indeed. And in this case, from 0 0.91 glucose, 0 0.26 goes to pyruvate. These are all rates in terms of carbon moles. Or we see that 23% of glucose goes to pyruvate, sorry, goes to pentose phosphate pathway in the first scenario where glucose is the only substrate. And in the second scenario, 7% of the carbon goes to pentose phosphate pathway. So by representing the reaction rates in terms of carbon moles, you can easily see which percentage of carbon goes to which pathway. So they wrote the reactions in terms of regular reactions. So the coefficients were not arranged based on carbon moles, but after they calculated their rates, they have converted them to carbon moles, and that's how they have uh, represented the rates in their figures. Let's look at the other example from 1997 from Jens Nielsen and from John Willatson's group, one of the key papers in the uh, field. They say that a stoichiometric model describing the anaerobic metabolism of Saccharomyces cerevisia during growth on a defined medium was derived. And the model was used to calculate intracellular fluxes based on measurements of uptake rates of substrates from the medium, secretion products, secretion of products from the cells, and the rate of biomass formation. So they measured a lot of things. They measured 13 rates. Acetate production rate, carbon dioxide production rate, succinate production rate, etc., etc. And this is the size of their metabolic network, which they, it, it includes 37 reactions and 43 metabolites. So they use this metabolic network system to predict rates. This is one of the figures from their paper. You see rates on the reactions. Again, you see here they define the rates in terms of carbon moles. So for 100 units of carbon from here, I see that 4% goes to carbohydrates, 6% goes to pentose phosphate pathway, uh, and about 1% goes to TCA cycle. In anaerobic conditions, remember, TCA cycle is almost inactive. We have talked about this in a very detailed way already. So we have seen here in this figure that in anaerobic conditions, only 1% of the carbon goes to TCA cycle. And rather, uh, there is fermentative pathways that are active here because carbons cannot go to uh, TCA cycle. We see ethanol production, 50% of the carbon ethanol 
and there is glycerol production. About 10% of carbon goes to glycerol. And this is the reaction list they have shared in their paper. As you see, they have defined the reactions in terms of carbon moles. So 6 glucose plus 1 ATP goes to 6 glucose 6 phosphate plus 1 ADP. And they have normalized the reaction coefficients by dividing it with 6. So this was my point. So if you don't know the carbon mole concept, you would get really confused to see those stoichiometries in the reactions when you check the uh, papers from 90s, 80s. So that's why I wanted to introduce carbon mole concept to you.